So first, thank you for welcoming me here. Um, and I want to thank this church for coming and serving uh, the organization that I represent at the Drop-In Center. You came and you served our workers and you served us um, dinner. And it was, I just want to thank you. I want to publicly thank you for that. It was a beautiful gift to all of us. Um, so, hope. That's going to be my message today. That's what I'm going to be talking about. The hope that um, has been given to me and the hope that I want to share. So, um, my story. I guess that's where we'll start, right? So, I'm a mom and I'm a wife. My husband is here with me today and um extremely supportive husband. I don't know how I could do any of what I do without his love and support. Um, I'm a mom. I'm a mom of four. Three of them are adults. One is almost. Um, we're about six months away from that magical 18-year-old where they think they can go and do everything. And um, yeah, so that's this next six months. Please pray for us <laughs> so that as he thinks he's launching out there into the big world that he'll get a clue. <laughs> Um, three adult children. I have two daughters and a son that are all in their 30s. Uh, we have eight grandchildren. So one of them is about to graduate college in May. So we're super excited about that. So that's just a, a little bit of our background. So why am I here? Why am I here to tell you about the hope that we have? So I have a son, our third child, who's now 32. Um, who has suffered from substance use disorder. At the age of 15, he had his first experience of an overdose. He overdosed on clonopin, alcohol, and marijuana, partying with a friend. I remember getting the call from that young man's father saying something has happened and you need to come and pick him up. And we got to the home and both of our sons were slumped over the kitchen table practically unresponsive. We loaded our son into our family vehicle and headed out for the hospital. And we were pretty confident that our son had stopped breathing in the back seat. So we pulled into the fire department in Carver. At the time, we were living in Middleborough. So we pulled into the Carver Fire Department. They immediately loaded him into an ambulance and zoomed out of um, the parking lot there. I was in the ambulance with, with our son and my husband followed behind in the car. And probably about three to five minutes out, the paramedic team caught up with the ambulance and the vehicle, the ambulance pulled over, a paramedic joined the team and had to administer what I now understand was probably Narcan for my son because he had stopped breathing. We got to the hospital in Plymouth where um, he was rushed into the ER and lots of activity happened and the conversation with the doctor and the ER went as follows. So what's going to happen here after, you know, after we're done here at the hospital? Will we go to a program? What, what is happening? You know, what's the next step? And the doctor just leaned up against an empty gurney in the ER and said to us, oh, if he can get up in the morning and stand and urinate, you can take him home. And he's 15. And the doctor starts joking about, oh, you should have been here last weekend. It was, the, this room was full of them. And I, my husband and I are like, what? You're just sending him home? Shouldn't he like go somewhere for 30 days? He needs help. No, no. And we're talking 17 years ago. So 17 years ago, that was the protocol. If you had a loved one who had overdosed, if you can stand up in the morning and urinate, they went home. So our family that summer, my oldest daughter and her husband were working at a camp out in Colorado, a faith-based camp out in Colorado. And we sent our son out there. He was out there for the whole summer and came back. What appeared to us is very changed. Um, went back to school, did really well, eventually started working um, out of high school. He didn't graduate. He ended up going to night school, um, but started working in the HVAC trade and worked for about a year and a half. And at the age of 18, he had a hand injury from an impact drill. 
shattered the scaphoid bone in his wrist, which is one of the most difficult bones in your wrist or hand to heal. It takes a very long time. He had two hand surgeries. Both times was given Oxycontin. And I don't need to tell you what happened, right? I mean, he became addicted in very short order. I remember a time period somewhere around 18 and a half to 19 years old that he was sick for three weeks. I thought he had a fluid he just couldn't kick. What I know now was he was trying to withdraw on his own. He was trying to stop this medication on his own. It was very sick for a three-week period. So for the next um, number of years, our family um, realized there was something going on. I knew that he'd struggled with these pills and was probably using them off and on. We moved here to East Bridgewater in 2008. All of us um, that are now parents of someone either with substance use disorder or in recovery will tell you that we'll do anything. We'll, we'll sell a house and move to a different community hoping that that will bring about the change, right? Um, and I'm going to tell you, selling my home in Middleborough and moving here to East Bridgewater didn't change anything because water seeks its own level. And he was actively using in Middleborough, and he found a way to actively continue to use here in East Bridgewater. So we moved here in August of 2008, and November 16th, 2008, we were changing up the bedroom upstairs where my son stayed, and he was away for the weekend. And my husband came downstairs, and the look on his face was just ashen white. And he held out his hand, and in his hand were two syringes. And that was the moment we discovered that our son had moved to IV heroin use. For those that know me in the room, they know I'm a very strong person, and not much gets me. That devastated me. It was one thing to know that my son was dealing with a problem with prescription drugs. It was another thing, that moment, that I learned that he had moved to a street drug and was injecting it into his arm. It was a very devastating moment for our family. And I remember confronting my son when um, he came home. I don't remember where he was, but I do remember, do definitely remember that day. It was, it was actually the fourth anniversary of my mother's death. So it was a day that um, was already an emotional day for me, and never mind adding, adding that to the mix. And, you know, at that time in my life, um, I was teaching women's ministries. I was in God's word all the time, preparing to teach. And that, and I'm going to tell you, was what sustained me through that most devastating time. I was constantly in God's word. I was constantly challenged by God's word. I was constantly working with other women and Iron sharpens iron, right? And the more we're in his word and the more that we're with each other in that, that is what got me through some of the most difficult and devastating times um, in in the history of what's, what's happened over the last now 17 years of my son's life. So we moved here to East Bridgewater, um, definitely welcomed to our little cul-de-sac community. We moved to a very small cul-de-sac, nine homes. I remember when we moved here, we literally were thrown a welcome barbecue by all of our neighbors. It was, I mean, we got to meet them. It was great. Um, I remember sitting with our, our very next door neighbor who lives to our, our right, um, thinking, oh, I really like her. She reminded me so much of my best friend through high school. She looked similar. Just, just, there was something about her that just was like, was drawing me in and, our kids started playing together. We, our son, our youngest son at the time was, oh, was he five when we moved? Five, going into kindergarten, first grade. Their daughter was six. They were great playmates. It was just wonderful until they discovered that our son was suffering with a drug issue. We were ostracized. I remember going over to her house. Um, to speak with her about something, and she let us know that they were in contact with an attorney to have us removed from the neighborhood. I was like, what? I, 
I mean, first of all, that's not even possible. But to to hear that your neighbor was pursuing legal action to have you removed from the neighborhood, I walked away wounded. This is my new friend. This how is this going to affect our five year old and his new playmate? Like, like I, I I went home and I'm like, Rick, you're not even going to believe this. Like, I can't even imagine. I can't. Im- how does can that even happen? Like, I called a friend of mine. Like, can this even happen? Like, this wasn't a this wasn't a homeowners association. There was this is just a regular cul de sac. So. Um, I'm going to tell you that the next five or six years living in that neighborhood was very difficult. Um, my own attitude took a nosedive. Like every time I saw them, I was like muttering under my own breath, like, oh, I would go out and mow my lawn and I'm thinking these things in my head, like just, just so pained by this and so angered by this. Um, all the while, still teaching Sunday school every Sunday and God using his word over and over again in my life to bring about a healing in me that had I not been in his word, had I not been doing that, I'm going to tell you, I probably would have ended up one of the most angry, bitter people. Um, That's why I'm very grateful. I am very, very grateful for what God has done in me and through me in this journey. So I want to share a verse with you that really, um, that it really speaks to me and it has spoken to me much during this whole process. First Peter 3.15, honor Christ and let him be the Lord of your life. Always be ready to give an answer when someone asks you about your hope. Now a little bit about this verse. So first Peter right, was written by Peter to the people of Asia Minor, to both the Jews and the Gentiles. And 1 Peter 3 starts out with Paul's instruction to wives, and then to husbands, and then to all the church. And then the last nine verses, the biggest section of chapter 3, is dedicated to instructions to people who are suffering. Suffering for Christ, suffering an illness, There's no real indication about what they're suffering for, but in the middle of that section of nine verses, we're told to remember the hope that's in us and to give an answer for it. So throughout my journey in this, I have remembered that there is a hope in me, that there's a hope that I can share, that there's a hope that I have for my son. If I had believed that My son's path is only going to lead to destruction. I probably, I don't know that I would have made it through either. But I also had to deal with the reality that it could lead to destruction, that my son's illness could lead to a fatal overdose and I could lose him. And that I had to believe that even in that, that God would have something. That through his time of active use, I had to believe that there was something that God had that through his time of incarceration, I had to believe that God had something in that. And I had to believe that even if I were to lose my son, that God would have something in that. I have a very dear friend who did, in fact, lose her son shortly um, after he became active in using drugs. His tenure of suffering from this disease was very, very short. And Mary now sees that as a huge blessing to her family. And from that, the hope that's in Mary, Mary was not a believer um, prior to her son's death. Her son, in his journey, in trying to seek out recovery, actually started going to a church in Halifax. And after her son's death, Mary followed her son's path to that church. Mary found Jesus at that church. Because of her son's death. Mary now shares her grief here in the community. She started her own organization called Matthew's Candle. Matthew is her son. And she now ministers to other families who have lost their sons and daughters and loved ones 
because of a substance pattern. Mary found the hope within. And that's, that is what we can count on. When everything else fails, when there is suffering in our lives, when there are things that have got us so broken down, when we're unemployed for a year and a half, I mean, our family has endured that too. My husband was unemployed for nearly two years during all of this. Um, there's a hope that perseveres. There's a hope that helps us take the next step. There's a hope that says there has to be something more. It took me about three or four years to gain knowledge about substance use. And for God to clearly say to me, there's something I have for you. Now, the other night I was sitting with Karen and the pastor and kind of sharing my story. And I kind of told him that what I believe God wanted me to do years ago was to be a retreat speaker. Like, that's what I wanted. That's what I was planning for. That's what I was um, pursuing. I had gone and gotten myself some training. And I figured that's that's what I want, right? God was like, no. I'm going to use what you're learning, but totally in a different place. Like, it is not going to be at a women's retreat somewhere sharing God's word. I am going to have you stand up and tell people about your son's disease and how there's hope and how there's still joy and how there's still something in it. So in 2012, um, Sometime around the end of 2011, 2012, I started going to a parent support organization called Learn to Cope. And Joanne Peterson, who's the founder of that organization, very strong woman, I absolutely love her. She would always have that call to action. Like, you need to be doing something in your community. You need to be, you know, writing letters to your congressmen, your senators, your local um, government that we need to, you know, whatever, whatever her call to action was. And so I did that. I wrote letters to all the different department heads here in the town of East Bridgewater. And I said, this is what's been happening in my family. And I know it's happening here in East Bridgewater. And I actually backed up the letters with articles from the Enterprise about what had been happening here in East Bridgewater. And I said, I want to be a voice in the community. I want to be a voice for change. And I, about two weeks after the letters went out, I got a phone call from then Chief John Cowan. And he said, I got your letter. And he said, the first thing I want to say is thank you for not telling me I needed to do something. You're the first person who's offered to actually help. And he invited me to the station. And so I sat down with that first initial meeting was just with him. And He's like, let's do something. What do you, let's do something. Let's inform the community. We need to be reaching out to the community. We need to um, tell them what's going on. And, you know, we want to, um, we want to do some sort of awareness event. So we brought a few more people around the table, included um, now Chief Allen and Bridgewater Savings Bank was there. The YMCA was there. There were a few other people. The school got involved, and we did our very first event at the school in October of 2012. It was called Don't Be Blindsided, because I felt that that is what happened to my family, and I know that it was happening to other families. And if we could just help families understand that this could happen in any household, because too often we think that that happens to everybody else. That happens to that bad family down the street. They deserved it, right? They don't parent well. They don't take good care of their kids. Like, we have every thought in our mind as to why that's happening to that family down the street, and it's not going to happen to mine. We don't think that that could possibly happen. I mean, I thought I was protected, right? I went to church. My kids were raised in the church. They went to youth groups, Sunday school. Two of my kids had gone on missions trips. I had a daughter that was doing ministry out in Colorado. Like, this can't happen in my family, right? I'm a good parent. 
I raised my kids right, but the fact of the matter is, it was happening everywhere. There's lots of reasons why. Our pharmaceutical companies, our doctors, etc. I won't get into all the politics behind it, but our kids were being turned on to medication that never should have got into their hands. And our families were getting devastated. And the shame and the stigma that is perpetrated upon us as families, as people who are suffering from the disease, like that's what got the hair on the back of my neck standing up, right? Like I'm not, I am not living in this shame and I don't want my friends that I care about living in that shame either. So the, don't be blindsided. We wanted to share with the people in this community just exactly what was happening. So during the start of that little um, thing around the police department table, after that October event, we decided, um, we got back together and we were like, we want to do something more. We want to keep this rolling. We want to make sure that the message continues to be spread here in our community. And I want you to know that when that launched, things were still not well within our household. From 2008 until 2014, my son was in active use. Many, many overdoses. We had lost count of how many times he had gone in, in and out of detoxes. Um, I remember I was away. I was actually at a conference out in North Carolina, and my son overdosed in my home, literally died on the floor in his bedroom. And thankfully, a friend who was there who knew CPR and knew to call 911, he was revived, revived with Narcan. But I remember him coming home from the hospital and refusing treatment too. And our having to say, if you're not going to take treatment, you can't stay here because we can't have this continuing in our home. And it's very, very difficult for a parent to tell their child, you can't live here. And I did that more than once. One time that we did that was during a snowstorm. And he and his girlfriend lived in their car for three weeks during one of the most snowiest seasons and coldest seasons that we've ever had. I believe that was the winter of 2013. So here I am trying to help my community, and I can't help my kid. I can't stop this disease for my son. But I wanted to be sure. I wanted to be sure that our community knew that this disease was real, that it wasn't a sin, that it wasn't bad behavior, but that it was a disease that was happening to the people that we love. And it wasn't just happening to our youth. It was happening to people of all ages within our community. Since um, I started doing this, our community has lost people from the age of 14 to 56 from this disease. This isn't just young people out there partying. This is happening at every age level within our community. And we need to be doing something about it. We can't, you know, um, tough love has not helped us at all. Kicking our loved ones out has increased homelessness. It's increased overdose. It's increased suicide rates by substances. Because we were taught that that was the only answer as parents was tough love. But Jesus says to help those who can't help themselves, right? We're told to extend brotherly kindness and love. The Good Samaritan told us to pick up that broken person and care for them and carry them and pay for their care. Like we're taught in scripture to do something totally different than what the world keeps telling us we're supposed to do with those people that are affected with substance use disorder. Like there's got to be something different. There's got to be something more. Sorry, I'm probably getting off track, but um this hope that I know has been within me is what has carried me through this whole journey of I believed in that tough love and I told other parents to do that and I feel horrible now. I feel horrible that that's what I would tell someone to do. Because I have learned that no, we need to be doing something different. Could there possibly come a time where we have to have that loved one removed from our home for their own safety, for the safety of our home, 
Yes, but is the street the answer? No. <laughs> we need to make sure that we are bringing them to a place where they can find treatment and hope. And not just to the street where there's nothing, where there's no answer, where there is no hope, where there, all there is is a cold concrete floor to sleep on who knows where. So E.B. Hope came out of all of this. E.B. Hope became a movement here within the community, um, the coalition work that's been done here. We've done a lot of work with the school system, with the police department, with the Council on Aging. One of the things that we wanted to be sure about was that every spectrum here in the community was educated. It had that they would have the resources that they needed at the school level, at the counseling on aging level. We've done a couple of events here with them the last three years, and I've I've just been blown away by that cohort of people who are willing to sit there and say, "This is a problem in our community. This is a pro we're overprescribed by doctors. We know that some of our peers are over medicated." We know that. We know that this is happening, and we don't know what to do. Where's our resources? Where's our help? So we've been able to do that. We've been able to make sure that every age category here in the town gets some sort of information, help, specifically for them. And since then, we've decided um, the coalition work in 2015, um, June of 2015, Gloucester, police department in Gloucester, launched the ANGEL initiative. And what that was, was that people who were suffering from substance use could come to the police department and ask for help. And they would be partnered up with what is now called a recovery coach. Back then it was just a recovery ANGEL. And that person would sit down with them and start making phone calls to help get them into treatment. And it didn't matter if the person that showed up at the police department had warrants, it didn't matter if the person that showed up at the police department had drugs on them, they could bring it to the police department and the police department would get them help. So our coalition said, we want to do something like that. What can we do? So we um, enacted what became the drop-in center here in East Bridgewater. And this is where your church came and ministered to us and ministered to the people that were at the drop-in center. So what happens at the drop-in center? The drop-in center is a place where those who are suffering from the disease can find help. We have a clinician who is there that will sit down with them and help them find the treatment that they need. We have parent support that is there so that parents can come and sit down and have a conversation with someone who knows what they're going through, who knows how to help them find the resources and support that they need. And we help people in early recovery get connected to the resources that they need. That launched in November of 2015, and since then, over a 1,000 people have been helped. We now have two locations, one here in East Bridgewater and one in Plymouth. And people are finding the help and resources that they need. And since then, we have launched the Paving the Pathways um, initiative. Because we're finding that we're helping people get them into a detox or get them into treatment somewhere along the way. And maybe after two weeks to 30 days, they have nowhere else to go. They're leaving treatment. Families who've been taught for years, tough love, aren't welcoming them back in their home. They have nowhere to go. They're out on the street, living homeless or surfing couch back out there, feeling hopeless and helpless. So what we've done is we have raised monies to offer scholarships to people that are ready to continue their journey. And we scholarship them into recovery residences where they continue their recovery journey. And we've um, received a $10,000 grant from Good Samaritan Hospital to now go back to those same people at the 30-day mark, 60-day mark, and 90-day mark and say, what else can we help you with? Do you need a outfit for that job interview that you're getting? Do you need transportation to that job interview? We have one young lady that um, she needs a pair of glasses. And we can use those funds to make sure that they're getting the resources that we need. they need. 
when you are living in this disease, hope is hard to find. You can get stuck with nobody supporting you. Homelessness, people get stuck there because they have no hope. And those of us that know and love Jesus, who have that hope within us, we best be certain that we're called to share it. It's not just ours to hold on to in that tight jar inside of us and just be grateful that we have it. I mean, I am grateful that I have Jesus living within me. And I am grateful that he has sustained me through some of the most difficult times in our lives. But I best be sharing. I best be using the gifts and the talents and the knowledge. I have absolutely zero background in anything medical or scientific. I work and do accounting work. and. So numbers is my game. Science, research, that is not my thing. But I am going to tell you that God has empowered me to know and understand much about substance use disorder, about codependency, about um, the whole this whole gamut that I have no education in. It has been a gift from God to know what I now know. If I'm not sharing it, if I'm not making sure that people find hope? I'm not doing what God's called me to do. We've been very, very blessed within our organization that many of the people within our nonprofit and many of the people that volunteer at the drop-in center are believers. And they do it for the same reason. Because they have that hope within them. And they know they need to share it. They know that they need to be part of the solution, that God's called them to be part of the solution. This is um, something that we're doing here for the community. It's called the Hidden in Plain Sight Mobile Unit. Karen had said she wanted me to make sure that this got shared. So this is a prevention tool. Hidden in Plain Sight is a tool that we will use for adults only. Children will not be allowed in this. And what the adults will learn is where your kids or your loved one, could be your husband or your wife, are hiding drugs? What are some of the indicators of drug use? We'll be using this mobile unit not only here in East Bridgewater, but throughout. We will share this mobile unit throughout Plymouth County. Um, we were hoping to have it launch actually this week for the Parent Teachers Conference here in East Bridgewater. That is not happening. We're probably about three weeks delayed. But that's okay. We'll probably use it. The, we're hoping now the new goal is to use it for the pre-prom assembly here, the mandatory pre-prom assembly for parents um, in East Bridgewater. So this is a tool that we will be able to use to help parents recognize potential use by their children and or other loved ones within their household. So again, I'm going to bring us back to this verse, honor Christ and let him be the Lord of your life. Always be ready to give an answer when someone asks you about your hope. And I want to end with um, one last thing that we're told in John 14, 12. I tell you, whoever believes in me, the hope, will do the works I have been doing, sharing hope, and they will do them even greater than these. Jesus wanted to be sure that before he left, this was before he was crucified, he wanted to be sure that his disciples understood, you are to continue what I have been doing. You have been with me, the hope, for the last three years. I'm not leaving you. When I do go, I will send you the Comforter, and he will stay with you, the Holy Spirit. And because of him, you will do even more than me, because there's more of you. And you will continue to share the hope. And I know that that's what God is calling me to. And I know that's what God calls each and every one of us to. Your suffering in your life might not be substance use disorder. Your suffering within your family might be something totally different. Let God use that. Let God use 
whatever that thing is that besails your family, let God use that as a hope that you can share with someone else. Because I believe that's what we're called to, each and every one of us. In this world, we will not escape suffering. It's going to be part of the human experience. But because of Christ, and because of the hope within us, we can share what he's given to us. Thanks for letting me be here with you. Great job. Susan, do you want to stay up here? Yeah. Um, what a great message. Thank you, Jesus. You know, the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. You know, as a believer, when we put on the armor of God, we can take back land. We can take back territory that's been lost. And we can we can see kingdom activity happening, breaking in in our homes, in our families, in our community. And it takes a lot of courage to do that. So, could we stand? And could I have the ministry team come down front? So we're going to do some ministry time. If that message, well, that's that's without a doubt, the message hit hearts here. There's no doubt in my mind. But if you feel like there's something that you need to bring to the Father, or you'd like some prayer for that, I, I'd encourage you to come down front and pray with someone. Uh, but also Susan's going to hang out for a little bit. And if you'd like to speak with her, if there's any questions, anything like that, um, she's going to extend her time here with us. So uh, let me just close this in prayer. Father, thank you for what you're doing. What you're doing in each one of us and through each one of us, Lord. The hope that you bring, Lord. Come, Holy Spirit. More of your presence here right now. Father, it's no accident that we are where we are right now. Standing here in this room, we live wherever we live, the circle that we live in. Father, you see it all. You see our circumstances. We just welcome you to work in that. We look to you for the answers, Lord. And I just uh, pray courage over those here that, that um, they feel a tug in their heart to do something, that they feel like God is calling them to. they're scared. So, Father, would you comfort that right now in the name of Jesus? Thank you for this time. Thank you for this message, the blessing of working through Susan. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.